About a month ago, I bought an electric skateboard. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of electric skateboards on the market right now with all kinds of different options. So I had to do a bunch of research to find the right one for me. I wanted to go fast and I wanted to go long distances between charges. I wanted a board that was strong enough to hold a grown man and I wanted a well-built board that would last over time. And of course, I didn't want to pay very much. So I compared those specs on hundreds of skateboards, top speed, battery range, weight capacity, reliability, and price. I read customer reviews and I watched YouTube videos and checked out skateboard after skateboard. And then I saw one that checked all my boxes. It was on sale for a really great price and in the videos it looked like it worked really well. So I bought it and I'm very happy with my decision. Whee! I did exactly the same thing when I bought the camera that I'm using to shoot this video. I did the same thing when I bought the microphone that I'm using to record this audio. I did the same thing when I bought the computer that I'll be using to edit this later. We did the same thing when we bought our house. We're just starting to look for a car and so we're gonna be doing the same thing in that whole process. It's called being an educated consumer. And there's actually a formula that determines when and what we buy. Purchases happen when CD times FP is greater than C plus F. Let's break that down. Buying something starts with CD, current dissatisfaction. Let's say your family starts to grow and you're dissatisfied with your current housing. That's the CD. So you form a vision of a house with another bedroom or a bigger kitchen or a laundry room or a yard or all of those things. That's called the future promise, the FP. And it's not just about features. It's about the better life that you imagine that you will live after your purchase. But of course, every purchase has a cost. That's the C on the other side of the equation. The cost is the rational negative. How much money will you need to make a down payment? How much will your mortgage payments be? How much will it cost to live in that house in that neighborhood? Can you afford it? And will it be worth it? Also on the other side of the equation, you have fear, the F, the emotional negative, the worries about unknown future events. What if we lose our jobs? What if property values go down in that area? What if we're not happy there? What if we see a better house on the market after we sign? Every purchase decision breaks down into this formula from a new home to a cup of coffee. When your current dissatisfaction with what you have and the future promise of an advertised product are greater than your perceived cost for the item and your fear about buying it, you will buy. If the cost is too great or the fear is too great, you will not buy. It's as simple as that. This is how advertising works too, by the way. To sell a product, your sales pitch needs to make the consumer feel dissatisfied with what they already have. Then you need to promise them a better future with your product. You need to set a price that they can afford, and then you need to help them feel secure and less fearful about the unknown. You can compete with other products on the market by adding features to make your promised future more attractive than your competitors, by making your product cheaper than theirs, or by making your customer afraid of the other guy's product. And every day, hundreds of times a day, advertisers are spending billions of dollars to cause all of these feelings and to manipulate this equation in you so that you'll buy their stuff. Now, let me tell you how I picked a wife. The first time I saw Belen, I knew she was special and I didn't know why. We didn't speak the same language, but we understood each other at a deeper level somehow. Two years later, we saw each other again and there were sparks in the air. We still didn't speak the same language, but the moment I saw her, I decided that I was gonna figure out how to ask her to start a romantic relationship with me. I didn't know much about her. I didn't know her likes or dislikes. I didn't know her future goals. I didn't know who she was as a person. It was all a huge risk. I didn't do that kind of thing, so I was terrified, and I had no idea what the future would look like if she said yes, because we lived in different countries. But there was something there that I couldn't explain and that I couldn't deny. You can call it attraction, romance, love, a deep spiritual feeling. And for once in my life, I just went with it. I made her a necklace and I wrote her a note explaining in broken Spanish that I wanted to get to know her better in a romantic type way. And I gave her the necklace and the note, not knowing if she would understand, if she would be offended, or if she had a boyfriend who would come beat me up. I'm mostly a rational person. I make decisions by weighing options, comparing alternatives, and trying to make solid plans for the future. But when it came to Belen, there was something way deeper than all of my thought processes that just knew that she was the one. 
So I did what I never do. I threw caution to the wind. I listened to that deeper thing and I took a huge risk with no thought for any of the consequences for the future. I ended up with a best friend who's funny, smart, artistic, and fun to be around. She's a wonderful mother to our children. She cares for me selflessly when I'm sick or frustrated in a way that leaves me speechless. And she loves God truly and from the heart. I ended up with a marriage built on trust and commitment and faith. And I ended up with a future that I never could have imagined for myself, all because I took a risk on a feeling that I didn't understand and asked. And all because she took a risk on her feelings and said yes. I know that it doesn't work out like that for everyone. I know that taking a romantic risk on someone you barely know can end in disaster. I know that to protect ourselves, there's a temptation to shop for a mate like we would shop for a car or a house or a skateboard, comparing their looks, their education level, their income level, their fitness, their prior relationships, and their style with other people to see if we're getting a good deal. But think about what we're doing to people when we think of them like that. We're taking a human soul, the image of God, and we're reducing it to a product that we value based on its ability to make us happy. There's something blasphemous about that. And I think approaching marriage like a consumer, comparing options instead of like a lover taking a risk is why a lot of marriages fail today. Because I like my house, but I don't love it passionately from the heart. I like my skateboard and my computer and my hunting bow, but I don't love them like I love my wife or my kids or my parents or my sisters or my in-laws or my nieces and nephews or my brothers and sisters in Christ. It would be weird if I loved my stuff the way I love people. And I don't love all of you because I compared you with other people and built a community of human beings around myself who have the best features at the lowest cost to me. That's ridiculous. I love all of you because I love you and that's it. People are not products. And when we treat them like products, we kill any chance of real love. Imagine running that consumer equation with my wife. Let's say I'm currently dissatisfied with the woman I married. So I imagine a future with a better model and there's no such thing. So this is just a thought game. That relationship would probably cost me something. I'd probably need more money in a six pack. And I could never be sure going into it that I'd be happier with someone else than I am right now with my wife. So I weigh my dissatisfaction and my future promise against the cost and my fear. And I make a completely selfish decision that affects the lives of dozens of people. That is not how we're supposed to treat human beings. Compare that to the classic wedding vows. In the name of God, I, John, take you, Belen, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, forsaking all others until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. That is the kind of selfless promise, the kind of faith that can grow into real love. For a relationship to work, it has to be built on that kind of commitment. And even then, there's no guarantee. Because love for another person is not a purchase decision. We can't compare our lover to other people and pick the one that benefits us the most and expect to end up with real love. We have to forsake all others and go all in with one person, flaws and all. I know it's a deep, spiritual, irrational risk and that it could end horribly for you, but that's what makes love so awesome. What I want to talk about today is the danger of approaching our relationship with Christ as consumers. And I also want to talk about the danger of building a church on that kind of consumer mentality because we can only really know Christ as lovers and we can only build real communities as friends. And both of those things require a major shift in our thinking about spiritual things. Something that really bothers me is the way the gospel has been presented as a sales pitch in the last few decades. It's a sales pitch that actually follows the consumer formula. First, we create dissatisfaction. God is mad at you because of your sins and you will go to hell when you die and you need to worry about that. And then we promise a future. But if you believe in Jesus, you will live in paradise for all eternity. We talk about how affordable it is. It doesn't cost you anything, just your faith and your church attendance and 10% of your income, but we'll talk about that later. And we build up your fear. You should be afraid of other religions or other versions of Christianity because they're wrong and we're right. And if you follow them instead of us, you'll go to hell. See, 
We've been talking about Christianity in marketplace terms, just like advertisers trying to push people into making a spiritual decision based on a sales pitch. My generation of preachers is struggling with this pitch because the people we're talking to right now don't believe in hell anymore, even if they do believe in God. So by force, we've had to make it more relevant, more practical, or whatever word like that you want to use. We still create dissatisfaction. You should be dissatisfied because you're not living up to your potential as a human being. We still promise a future. The teachings of the Bible can help you manage your money, raise your kids, love your wife, and run your business much better than you're doing right now. We still talk about the cost and how affordable it all is. Again, the cost is faith and church attendance and 10% of your income, but don't worry about that yet. And we still play to your fears. You should be afraid of what is going to happen to society if we don't all get with God's program. The problem with both of those pitches is they want you to use your rational mind to weigh your spiritual options and then pick Christianity as the best deal. Just like you're buying insurance or investing in a retirement plan or supporting a political party or buying a skateboard, that kind of spiritual sales pitch can only get you thinking like a consumer. And as a consumer, I'm selfish by nature. I'm always looking for the best deal, the best features and the greatest benefit at the lowest cost to me. When I become a spiritual consumer, I look for the system that will help me feel like I understand the world. I look for the system that will help me feel less guilt about my sin. I look for the system that will give me practical advice so that I can be successful and well-respected. And I look for the system that will help me with my fear of death. And what our marketplace Christianity offers me as a consumer is the advice of the Bible to help me organize my life and the blood of Jesus Christ to help me manage my guilt, free at no cost to me and with all of those amazing features. It sure seems like a pretty good deal. So what's the danger in presenting the gospel like that? The danger is that it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what Christianity is. Our faith, the blood of God, is not another product for sale on the marketplace. It's not practical advice. It's not a retirement program or an insurance policy or medicine for a guilty conscience. Our faith is a person who doesn't call us to choose him as the best spiritual deal, but who calls us to know him in a dynamic and risky relationship of love and personal transformation. If we really look at following Jesus like a consumer, who would ever do it? Let's run the formula. Jesus calls me away from every kind of material satisfaction into a dangerous spirit world where nothing is certain or stable. He actually calls me from satisfaction to dissatisfaction, from comfort to discomfort. Jesus promises me that if I follow him, I will have trouble. I will be misunderstood and hated by the world and Satan will attack me every chance he gets. What kind of a future promise is that? The cost is that I have to die to myself and what I want. I have to pick up my cross and follow him. I have to be humble, meek, and forgive others when I'm persecuted. I may need to sell my possessions and give the money to the poor. I may need to leave my family, my community, my culture, and give up on any hope of being rich or famous or powerful while I learn to care about the needs of other people more than my own. Because God's gift of grace is free. But that is what the actual cost of faith in Jesus Christ is. And then there's fear too, because they killed Jesus and they might kill me. Almost all the apostles who followed Jesus were killed. And they might not kill me, but there are plenty of people who can certainly embarrass me in public and make me look foolish because of my faith. The consumer equation just doesn't work for authentic Christian faith. It's no wonder we came up with a bunch of sales pitches about politics or the afterlife. We had to bury the truth. If you have other options, who would honestly choose the life that Jesus calls you to? But what the world and most Christians don't understand is that a real disciple of Christ isn't someone who sat down, weighed all the options, and decided with their head that Jesus was the best product on the market. A disciple of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus because they love him. When Jesus is calling people to be his disciples, some of them run the cost-benefit equation and decide to say no. Luke 9, 57 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, 
but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. These people are thinking like consumers. And the dangerous life that Jesus calls them to isn't enough to outweigh the cost and the fear. To them, Jesus is a bad deal and they just pass on him. But there are others who see the exact same factors of Jesus' call and still jump at the chance to follow him. Peter and Andrew immediately leave their fishing nets. James and John immediately leave their dad in the boat. Matthew immediately leaves his tax collection booth and they just go follow Jesus. They aren't comparing options or running cost-benefit analysis. They just leave everything. They take a huge risk and go with him wherever he takes them. Why would they do that? Because they aren't thinking like consumers with their heads. They're thinking like romantics with their hearts. Jesus walks by and there are sparks. They don't really understand his words or what he's doing, but Jesus speaks to something deep in their souls. They see him and they see hope and possibility and a goodness that they can't explain. They aren't drawn to his promises of a better life. In fact, it's pretty obvious from the beginning that he's actually calling them to a much harder life than the one they were living. What they're drawn to is Jesus because he loves them and they love him. And if you're going to know God through Jesus Christ, you need the heart of the lover, not the head of the consumer. The heart is where it all happens. Later on, these same disciples were given the task of sharing the message of Jesus with the world. How did they make such a tough sell? In Acts 10, we can see how Peter did it. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them all to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Notice that there's really no sales pitch here. Peter doesn't create dissatisfaction in his audience. He doesn't promise them anything. He doesn't give them a price or speak to their fears. He just tells the story of Jesus as he understands it. And the people who hear it feel the same sparks, the same pull to follow Jesus that Peter felt years before when Jesus called him. And it says that while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon his listeners. That should tell us that it's not the brilliance of our sales pitches that bring people into our city on a hill. God is already calling people and moving people and preparing people to respond to his son. And it has nothing to do with our clever words or a cost-benefit analysis. As Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. And that's why consumer-minded Christianity is so deadly. If we think about our spiritual lives like consumers, we might choose a version of Christianity based on a sales pitch that highlights all the best features for us. We might even think that we're doing God a favor by believing in him, like we're patronizing his small business. But we'll never know God, we'll never follow Christ, and we'll never be transformed by the Holy Spirit because we are not in love. What could be more terrifying than that? Jesus even warns us about this exact thing. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. So we need to make a major shift in our thinking. Why do we follow Christ? Why do we obey his commandments? Why do we deny ourselves and carry our crosses? It's not because we chose Jesus from the available options and we think we got a good deal. We follow Christ because he loves us, because he calls us, because he chose us. We follow Christ because we love him. And that's dangerous because if my skateboard disappoints me, I will throw it away without a second thought. But I would do anything, anything for my wife. Shifting my involvement with God from the category of consumer to the category of love is the biggest risk I could ever take. If I really love Christ, he could ask me for anything and I would give it. But that's the only way I will ever know God or become like Christ or be transformed by the Holy Spirit. If I give all that I am to the one who loves my soul, to the one who I love in return. Now, does that shift from consumer to lover change the way we do church? Absolutely. If we build our churches on a consumer model, we are stuck with trying to come up with the best sales pitch. We're stuck competing with other churches, trying to offer the best features at the lowest cost to the consumer. I know that's how churches and church people think right now, because when you ask someone why they go to their church, they'll list the specs, like they're trying to sell you a skateboard. They have a good kids program. Their pastor teaches in a way they like. The music is good. The service is at a convenient time for their family. And I get it. There's no good reason to make church less pleasant or less convenient for your members. But my worry is that if we do church like we're offering a product to consumers, we'll start to decide who we share the gospel with based on what they can bring to us. We'll go after those premium clients with money or influence instead of just whoever Jesus is calling to follow him. And as church people, if we decide what church to go to in the same way we decide what skateboard to buy, our relationship with other Christians will only be as deep as our relationships with the people who sit at other tables when we're at a restaurant. As long as the church makes us happy, we'll stay. But as soon as things get difficult or another church offers us better options for less commitment, we're gone. If you ask someone why they go to their church, it would be much better to hear, I go there because they really show me who Christ is, not just through their teaching, but through how they love and care for me. And they also challenge me to be like Christ in my own life and in my relationships with other people. I go there because it helps my soul grow into something better, even though that growth hurts sometimes. I go there because I love Christ and Christ is what my church is all about. That would be awesome to hear. But I have to be honest, I have never heard someone answer the question that way before. So we've got some work to do. And trust me, if the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is calling someone to follow him and you tell them that that's why you go to your church, instead of giving them a sales pitch, they will come and we will get to welcome them into the family of God. So let's learn to love God, not as selfish consumers, but as lovers, not from the head, but from the heart. Let's learn to trust that if we commit to telling the story of Jesus and living like Christ in all of our actions and our relationships with other people, the Holy Spirit will unite us with other people who are also ready to love him. And let's be the ones who follow Jesus Christ, not because we've weighed all the options and we think that his way is the most convenient or the most beneficial, but truly and simply because we love him, because he loved us first and he chose us and we love him back. And that's the whole reason that we're here.